Namaste and greetings. Yeah. I, Karnika Arun, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Samstan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI, hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are gathered for a special talk on a strategic framework for outcome-driven policy to transform manufacturing in India by V. Ramakrishnan. This deliberation is a part of the State of Foreign Trade, hashtag Talking Trade Series, which is organized by the IMPRI, Center for Study of Finance and Economics, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, Delhi. As the chair of today's talk, we have Professor Mukul Asher, former professor of Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. We welcome you, sir. Our esteemed speaker is V. Ramakrishnan, the Managing Director of Organization Development, Singapore. We are pleased to have you, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Moving to our esteemed discussants for today, we have with us Srikant Rao, Founder Director of Affordable Business Solutions. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. We are also delighted to be joined by Anush Ramasamy, the President and Managing Director of SKG Mill Limited. We welcome you to the session, sir. We are also joined by our series moderator, Professor Nalan Bharati, Professor at Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. Now, I invite our moderator, Professor Nalan Bharati, to initiate the deliberation with his opening remarks and to proceed further. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Karnika. Uh, uh, let me first welcome all the uh, discussant, main uh, speaker of this occasion, and also the chair of this session, Professor Mukula Sir. So uh, let me first uh, uh, begin uh, with few uh, uh, few remarks. Uh, and uh, what we see today, the Make in India uh, has a uh, little uh, past history. This has uh, linked with uh, the vocal for local, uh, Atnirbhar Bharat, uh, the Digital India, and uh, more recently, the Production Link Initiative a scheme, which has been announced by the government of India. So there are six superstar sectors, uh, which is uh, currently boosting this make in India. And uh, we have automatic uh, autom automotive uh, sector. Uh, this contributes around 12% of India's GDP and 65 million jobs. Uh, the target of the government is to transform this sector from uh, $74 billion to close to $300 billion. And apart from that, uh, uh, this electronic uh, system design and manufacturing is also one of the sector where uh, we are finding that uh, uh, we are uh, trying to have a target of 80 billion jobs, 80 billion dollar turnover. And uh, we are also targeting 1 billion mobile phones uh, produced by 2025. So the third sector, which is also one of the superstar sector is the renewable energy sector. And India has received FDI in this sector from, uh, from many uh, investors, uh, Oryx and Ostro, these are some of the investors. And uh, now the fourth uh, major uh, sector is the road and highways, where we are finding that uh, 50 kilometer uh, per day high highway target is now set by the government. Uh, next sector is the pharmaceutical sector where we are finding that the global generic exports in, in, the, in the global generic exports, uh, India has a 50% share. And uh, the last but not the least, since we are also one of the uh, country which, which has large population depending on agriculture. And we had this food processing sector where uh, 135 integrated uh, cold chains are being supported by the government and uh, seven mega food parks 
this is little older data, but we are finding that these parks, each food park creates 500 jobs and this is going to benefit 25,000 uh, families. So uh, this is this is the uh, this is the uh, some of the uh, points which I want to present before our speaker and before our chair will have his own remark. But uh, these points uh, makes uh, India in a different uh, uh, different uh, discourse today. Uh, the India which was uh, uh, 20 years before. Uh, is not the India today because we are targeting many new sectors. We are targeting many new areas for manufacturing. And more than that, uh, India has also started thinking like other uh, countries in terms of uh, uh, a smart manufacturing that includes artificial intelligence and machine learning, robotics, uh, additive manufacturing, internet of things, digital twin, and, uh, uh, and cloud computing. So uh, with this background, uh, uh, what, what we find here that this Art Nirbhar Bharat, uh, the self-reliant India, is a, not a new concept, but uh, in our previous plan period also, uh, we have found that uh, self-reliant came again and again in our plan document. And uh, India was also trying hard to, uh, to, to, to become self-reliant in some sectors. What I find a, a theoretical difference between the self-reliant which India had targeted in past and Atmanirbhar Bharat which India is targeting today is uh, previously we were uh, having this import substitution model, uh, 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 Nehru Mahalnovis model and most of the uh, thing where we, we were uh, having this uh, target to import uh, and uh, after that in third five-year plan and fourth five-year plan, we started thinking how to have certain production inside and how to uh, how to substitute that import. Today, India is not looking only uh, India is not targeting import substitution, but India is looking for the export promotion model, the EP model. And for that, we are looking for some of the sectors where India can establish its uh, its uh, uh, product in a way that it can export uh, to certain extent. So the six superstar sector, which uh, I have uh, uh, highlighted today, this is linked with not only with the make in India, but some of the sectors are also linked with the digital India. And some of the sectors are also linked with the new scheme that is announced by the prime minister uh, named as the Gati Sakti Yojana. So combining all together, together we find today that uh, uh, there is a strategic framework ready for India to transform manufacturing sector. So with this note, uh, I would like to invite uh, the chair of this session, Professor Mukula Sir, uh, for his remark, for his inaugural, inaugural remark. Uh, thank you, Professor Nalin Bharti. May I begin by congratulating the director, Dr. Arjun Kumar of Empire for consistently organizing high quality policy relevant webinars, which are helping to improve the quality of uh, economic and public policy dialogue in the country. So congratulations once again. Mr. Ramkrishnan and I have known each other and collaborated for nearly decade and a half, at least. And for an economist, academic economist like me, to collaborate and deliver capacity building programs and so on to research together with a management consultant. I would like to share the one very critical thing that I have learned in our collaboration. And that is that 
management consultants mindset is that of problem solving and of looking at the outcomes which is reflected in today's title of the webinar as well so it is this problem solving in a specific context so context of a company or context of a country and the outcome orientation which improves the uh, efficiency uh, and effectiveness is something that academic economists are not as prone to strongly emphasize. So he has really taught me a lot in our uh, collaboration. Let me try to supplement, uh, or not to supplement, but complement uh, Professor Nalin Bharti's remarks. In Mr. Ramkrishnan's uh, uh, presentation is going to be more micro-oriented. I thought, like Professor Bharti, I'd provide few macro economic aspects. Uh, in 2021-22, which is about to end in a few days in March, India's exports of goods and services uh, was USD 650 billion. This is the highest India has done. And the, if we take the imports of around 700 billion, roughly, we usually have a trade deficit. Um, so our total trade is 1,350 billion USD. Now that is very significant. Um, and we are on a earlier part of the uh, upward movement on that. This is reflected by the Commerce Minister setting the target of USD $1 trillion, 1,000 billion, for each goods and services by 2030. Target is very ambitious, but even if we come reasonably close to it, that would be a substantive qualitative difference in India's economy and in India's standing in the world. Professor Bharti provided some data uh, on the on, 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 on trade. I'll, I'll give a couple of more numbers. In 21-22, India exported, uh, in terms of defense exports, new item, uh, uh, 1.53 billion USD in the first 11 months. We still have a 12-month data to come. This is a six times increase since 2014-15. So structural changes are, are occurring. Defense is a new area for us. In 21-22, in the first 11 months, India's engineering exports surpassed USD 101 billion, which is uh, again for the first time uh, and main countries to which exports went were US, China and UAE. UAE with whom we are trying to create a special uh, relationship. Uh, in terms of while uh, Mr. Ramkrishnan will be looking at the company level and a micro level, it may also be useful to keep in mind what is the 
state distribution of share of exports. Uh, Gujarat and Maharashtra contribute 20% each. Tamil Nadu, 9%. Andhra and UP, 6%. So together, these contribute more than three fifths of India's exports. So the key now is try to expand the uh, uh, expand the uh, range and the geographic nodes and distribution of India's exports to Northeast, now to Jammu and Kashmir uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, it's also worthwhile to point out that the Niti Aayog just published Export Preparedness Index for India for, for step by four states for 2021. And they divide it in the coastal states, non-coastal others. In the coastal states, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and overall as well, are the first three in UT, Union Territories, Delhi and Goa. Some of the states which are coastal, like West Bengal, are last. So there is a lot of scope. Now, what does this report? It's a report worth reading. Fine. It says there are three major challenges for export promotion. Uh, first is intra and inter-regional differences in export infrastructure. So this is where the blue economy, uh, Sagarmala and Bharatmala, Udan, all the others, plus the other export infrastructure labs and so on that we need cold storage. Second, there is a weak trade support and growth orientation across states. So some states are not putting real, uh, as much effort to realize their potential. And third, there is a lack of R&D infrastructure to promote complex and unique products. Professor Bharti mentioned artificial intelligence, digital economy, and so on. And from the gift city as well, complex financial products that we need to put. Complex and unique products is, will need to be part of our efforts to improve the competitiveness. Final point is, when we go to the WTO and look at the trade profile of the countries, in the services trade, they have one component. The component is called goods-related services. What are those goods-related services? They are manufacturing services on physical inputs owned by the other parties. So maintenance and repair, not elsewhere classified, freight and so on, not elsewhere classified, uh, labeling and, and so on, posters. Uh, all of those are in there and they have to be ascertained by surveys. India has not been, has been lagging in this area, but let me, give you some WTO reported numbers. In this, uh, uh, this category, export was only 0 0.2 billion, 2019. As compared to Germany, 22.1 billion, since Mr. Ramkrishnan will talk about Germany at length, USA, 27.9, and Vietnam, 10.8. So we need, as we look at the manufacturing, we shouldn't look, ignore the goods 
related services item, which is usually not mentioned in the discussion. Thank you again for inviting me. It is an honor for me to participate in this. Uh, thank you, moderator, Professor Nalin. Thank you very much, sir. It, it is always a pleasure to listen to you with lots of inputs uh, from India and from outside the uh, outside India. So uh, may I now request uh, Mr. B. Ramkrishnan for his uh, uh, a special talk on this issue. Thank you, uh, Professor Bharti. Thank you, Mr. Arjun, Dr. Arjun Kumar for inviting me to this session. And Mukul, thanks for a very graceful introduction. And Srikanth, thank you for acceding to my request to contribute with your background in training and development, and of course, in software and a variety of industries, including hardcore manufacturing. And yes, Mukul and I have been pioneered a model called co-teaching. And you can see it has been effective for both of us. He has gone bald and I've gone gray, right? Now, I'm going to take a very different alternative stance because I have been associated with manufacturing starting with my father's factories at the age of 13. Age of 13 on the shop floor. So I'm a very hardcore base up shop floor engineer who with friends like Mukul have graduated into more intellectual and academic pursuits over 40 years. I've lived and worked around the world. I've run factories around the world and I personally believe that India is on a growth path that's going to be phenomenal, but it's not going to be automatic. I think there's a huge amount of work that is being brushed aside. And every report, I'm making this upfront, every report that I see, this sort of activities, what you started, how many people are working, what is this, 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 and so on and so forth. So I'm going to take a very different tack, a very hard tack, a very reasoned tack, and it may not go down very well, but uh, I would be able to respond with a lot of depth and details should it be required. Now may I share screen and move into the presentation, please? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Now I've called it a strategic framework because what we are talking about is essentially a very high level system from which we should derive policy. We cannot make policy in a vacuum. And that's one of my complaints, not only in boards that I sit in, is that we decide policy on an ad hoc basis without coherence or there's no cogent development of the policy. Right? One minute. Yeah. Now the outline is, as I've just mentioned, strategic outcomes and definition of strategic outcomes is a fundamental necessity to shape policy. For example, we took the five or uh, six uh, malas that are important. What is the essential outcome that the automotive industry has to deliver? It's clear. We have to substitute fossil fuels. Come up with any technology. Nobody is telling you how many hydrogen cars have to work, what size of battery, how much of uh, uh, fuel cells you need to use, how much of lithium, sodium, nothing is specified. But have we understood the impact of this simple outcome on the MSMEs, which support automotive, which is 50%, 49% of India's MSME are contributing to automotive manufacturing. Simply put, if we go EV, the demand for forgings, castings, and foundry work will drop by at least 70%. And that is about 80% of the jobs that people are involved in, in terms of machining and stuff like that. Similarly, what is the outcome that pharma has to deliver? What is the outcome electronics has to deliver? This has to be very clear, right? We, have, we are going to struggle hard, but it's also a huge opportunity to establish India as a manufacturing base in an increasingly service dominated world. India has the resources, India has the skills, the incipient skills, we need to do a lot of development, I'll come to that. And it needs to transform more of the same, just simply doling out cash and saying, this is what's going to be happening to my MSME is not going to work. 
I'll assess the current realities and look at the possibilities for a transformation. What I have done is I have polled about 40 senior people around in the industry from my contacts. I, not all responded. I've collated it and presented it in the course of the uh, presentation. And any information or details required, I'd be happy to share. Now, to set the baseline, right? We have to have cogent, we have to be clear with national outcomes because strategy is essentially a deployment of limited resources to deliver a specific outcome. If you don't know the specific outcome, whatever resources you're hiring, I always tell people when I'm teaching, it's like getting in a taxi and telling them, go from here to there and come back in 10 minutes. We don't know what's the direction. Outcomes are what has to be delivered to whom, by when, at what cost. Policy is a framework to ensure resourcing and delivery of outcomes. This is the base definition with which I'm starting. A transformation is a comprehensive redefinition of one or more product process systems or a combination. And it is critically, it is irreversible. And change is a reversible process. It's an alteration of a physical state. I can convert water to steam or ice and put it back into water. But if I take a caterpillar and it becomes a butterfly, it is transformed. There's no question of going back. And one of the problems that we have seen in the past with the import substitution. And when I came into the industry in the late 70s, early 80s, import substitution was a big thing. But believe me, no public sector wanted, no defense sector wanted any import substitution. In today's context, make in India is a different mindset. The outcome is different. It's a question of make in India for the world, not for India. India also we will supply. But essentially we are looking at the global picture. I asked a very senior industrialist, what is your market? He said, why do you ask me? He said, you're growing at 25% when your competition is growing at 7%. He says, I'm, my market is the world. I think that's the outcome that we need to be looking at. Whether it is pharma, whether it is food processing, whether it is agriculture, whether it is semiconductors, we cannot be just doing it as a substitute because PLI comes in and they're putting in money and are going to give it to us. So we are looking at a transformation and definitely not a change. And that should be a policy shift. And all the reading that I have done on all the various uh, government initiatives, I don't see clarity on this. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm blind, maybe I'm deaf, but I'm not dumb, I'm voicing that, right? We are draining resources in manufacturing today. I'll give you the slides for that. And critically, when, that, when we're draining resources, we impact the quality of living of people. Quality of living, is the lower end of Maslow's hierarchy. Food, clothing, shelter, safety, security, and all that that goes in. You're not looking at the aspirational sites. There are only two choices. You create value or you destroy value. Manufacturing, I'm very unhappy, is that it is draining value. Right? From cost arbitrage, we have to move to value generation. That is a strategic shift that we need to look at. Import substitution was cost arbitrage. We copied what somebody else did. We didn't pioneer it in any which way. The Jugard word didn't exist till 2010 or 2006 or 2007. We are capable of that, but we are also capable of doing a very crude job of it. How to refine it, how to make it appealing to the world is something that we have to look at. In other words, from being a me too, we also are in an also ran, we have to innovate. Now, innovation is not easy. It is very easily rolls off a lot of paper and tongues, but when a guy is cash starved, he doesn't think of innovation. He's looking at his next meal. Right Now, the quality of life are the aspirational wants. Now, many of the PLI-related schemes relate to aspirational wants. Right? And one of the things we need to bear in mind with most of the PLI schemes is these large companies which mass produce electronics and related stuff, the employment generation is very poor. If you look at any of their chart of accounts, employee cost will be less than 1.5% to 2% out of the total cost. Value addition is low because component costs are very high. So we need to be careful. Of course, they are necessary. Of course, it's much better to make the Apple phone in India and not import it. But that's not going to resolve any of our uh, critical issues that face India, which is employment. So what am I saying? The story so far is not a major driver of GDP. It has to become a major driver of GDP. In most countries which have grown have had a manufacturing uh, part of GDP at between 25 to 30% and we are struggling to hit 15%. 
Factor productivity is very low, which means land, labor, and capital. We consume far in excess of what our competition does, which makes us very expensive and sluggish. Value addition is poor. It has remained static in manufacturing at 33% for the last n number of years. Employment generation is nothing, is hardly worth anything. And the quality of jobs in manufacturing, in the, especially in the MSME, is very poor quality jobs. It's not a significant source of innovation. There are skill sets and resources are inadequate. This is the summary of manufacturing so far. There could be more aspects to it. I may be overstating a few aspects to it, but this is a broad summary. And this is the transformation is required in each one of these areas. Just to give you an example, I've lived and worked in Germany and I have a lot of respect for the way the Germans uh, middle stand companies. Middle stand is the MSME of Germany. Middle stand, the middle level companies. 99% of German firms are middle stand firms, right? 68% of exports. But that's not what impresses me. Having visited n number of German firms, the level of innovation that they bring that drives the BMWs and the Mercedes Benzes to global markets is phenomenal. It is outstanding. And it's not now. They have been doing it for the last 500 years. So there is a deep cultural heritage of innovation in the middle stand. It's the backbone of the German economy. In Japan, it's accounting for 99.7% 99, 99 of companies, 70% of employees, and 50% of all value, value added. In Korea, I've given you all the figures. It's equally impressive. Now, if you move to India, 33% of manufacturing output. It's an opportunity, yes. We have to increase the share from 8% to 15% by 2020. This was the CII vision statement. We have to generate employment, increase the share of MSME. Sadly, COVID has intervened, so we cannot really hold anybody to account for this. But the thing that we need to be aware of in this slide is much of the numbers that baseline numbers have remained unchanged for over a decade. Services has grown, right? Your Y2K happened 22 years ago, but since Y2K, the services industry has gone past 150 billion and we're still struggling in manufacturing. And now look, these are dated numbers. Sadly, I'm not able to get the latest numbers, but if you look at Indian manufacturing, it's SMEs. And Mukul asked me a question, why are you focusing on MSMEs? Because MSME is the backbone. If you cannot have an MSME, you cannot have a manufacturing unit. Right? Any big guy comes in, he's going to require somebody who makes some parts for him, somebody who maintains a machine for him, somebody who repairs his door, somebody who welds his uh, equipment. And in the case of Mercedes-Benz factory in Pune, somebody to rescue a leopard which ran into the factory. Right? These are all activities that are essential. You notice India MSME is 8% of the overall activity, whereas most others are in the 45 to 50% range. That's the gap but that's the opportunity for us as well. It's not been an employment generator, right? It generates just 21% of employment, whereas again, the average is around 70%, right? It has been static. Manufacturing share of industry is static and the, I read the latest report from the Ministry of MSME. It has actually come down to 33% now, right? So manufacturing is actually on a declining trend and has to be reversed before it grows significantly. Right Now, percentage shares are there. Manufacturing is 29% of the total gross value added. And that also has remained static for the last 50 many years, more than 15, 20 years. Compared to value added growth, you can see the trend lines are dipping. And I stress, if you don't generate value, you're destroying value. Right? For people productivity is falling despite better education. And we need to look at all this and ask ourselves, what is it that we have done and what is it that we could be doing more of and what should we be doing less of? And that's what I'm going to try to attempt, attempt over the next few slides, right? Now, if you take the Indian MSME, less than 4% of the companies have 500 or more workers, less than 4%, right? In Japan, it is close to 90%, uh, 70%, right? So the numbers are so feeble I'm so weak. Simply by saying that I'm going to do more of this, I'm going to consider more camps, I'm going to do more skilling, I'm going to do more training, I'm going to give more cash. This is not going to work. We need to have a base up level. And how should we look at the base up level? 
this is the result of the dipstick that I did. <clears throat> so how should we go about making this change? I asked people who are chairman of companies, founder of companies, audit firms, um, young entrepreneurs. Anush is just 42 and is an outstanding entrepreneur in textiles in a whole host of areas. He's also a venture capital uh, venture capitalist. These were all people whom I polled. I polled anywhere people from about 35 years of age to about 70 years of age. Basically, the feedback is, let's create a network of MSME support industries or clusters, as we call it. We've been talking about clusters for 30 years. right? And the food, food cluster that you just spoke about, it's not going to happen on its own. The outcome for the food cluster, if that is not clear, each guy will want to do what the other guy is doing. Because it's like this. I do organic farming in Kunor. And when we do the farming, the farmer next door sees that guy made carrots, grew carrots last year and made a lot of money. This year, I'm going to grow carrots. What happens is 10 people grow carrots, the market crashes. And then they crib that we are not making money. Same thing is happening in business. Indian MNCs are preferred over foreign MNCs. Uh, having done more than 21 joint ventures in my lifetime, I can tell you foreign MNCs are fair weather friends. They are here till such time as they can add some money back to their books at home. And after that, they are leave you high and dry and gone. It has happened to Malaysia. It has happened to Singapore. It has happened to uh, Philippines. It's happened to Korea. It's happened all over the place. Mexico. The second question I asked is, what are the primary outcomes for Indian manufacturing sector to deliver? You can see the maximum was globally competitive gross value added. That itself is the outcome that manufacturing has to set. What should be the gross value added for manufacturing over the next year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years? We should have a vision statement and we have to enable it and make it happen. That to me is primary. Now, promoting innovation, you can promote innovation only when you're successful and you have money. Most MSMEs don't know where they're going to get their money to pay the next salary. They're not going to innovate. So how are we going to further innovation? Government has tried central schemes like DRDO and a whole host of com companies with limited success. Some have been very successful like DRDO. Some have not been so successful. And what are the top five priorities? Actually, there were five priorities I asked for, but since the sample was limited, I just pasted the whole thing, the, barring a few where it was zero. Right? Garments and textiles is a huge opportunity area. But Vietnam and Bangladesh didn't exist in garments 30 years ago. And just as a matter of interest for this audience, do you know who's the second largest garment exporter in the world? Can anybody take a guess? It's Germany. China, Germany, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and then India. And yet, when we had to do face marks and PE equipment during COVID, the same textile and garment industry went to the government and asked for subsidies. That's the mindset which is destroying innovation in our country. Right? Of course, gems and jewelry, there's a minor added, value added agriculture, processed foods are good. But the question you ask yourself is, do processed foods really offer a market for export? I went into processed food manufacturing in 1991 when I was head of strategy for the Kirloskas. We found less than 2% of the Indian tongue accepts processed foods. Of course, it's grown subsequently. But it's nowhere like, like the West. In the West, I can go get a salad, I can go get a chicken tikka, I can get a dal, bunia, whatever it is, and make a meal. We're struggling with that. Pharma and healthcare. Yes, it's a huge opportunity, but not in formulations. The pharma industry gave up API and sent it to China. We are now struggling to get back into API. We just stopped making API because it is cheaper to import from China. Why is, it, why is it that China can make it and we are not able to make it in the same volumes? Today in India, we cannot complain about lack of volumes or economies of scale. They are immense. So there is a problem that we have here which is going under the carpet. Electronic components and IC chips, yes, it's vital, but that, should not, that is not the end game. What is the share of IoT that we want in the world market? For which we need broadband, we need all the infrastructure, we need all of that. It is just not chips and semiconductors. Chips and semiconductors conductors look easy. But my constant refrain is the volume of clean, clear water that they require per chip plant is 5 million gallons a minute. 
Do we have those resources? It's nice to talk about it, but the outcome it cannot happen unless you manage your water. Right? This is a simple uh, equation. Batteries for both the EV and the grid, grid storage and for uh, 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 cars is a very important part of it. I have a fully, uh, what can I call it? Alternative, alternative energy home. My house is fully solar. I have a patent on a underfloor heating using solar. All that is feasible. But battery life, solar life, solar cells are not easy to make. Of course, big, big players, Reliance, Adani have all got into it. It's an opportunity area. And batteries, it's a confusing plethora of uh, users. And electric vehicles, which people talk about, I was talking in the board meeting yesterday. As on date, there are 42 makers of electric vehicle scooters. Obviously, there's going to be a shakeout and it's going to happen over time. So there's going to be some downside to it as well. Now, I asked them, what are the best developmental models for our MSME? Should it be Germany? I had a variety of answers. Germany, Switzerland, South Korea, Singapore. But the maximum was we have to generate our own model. And I agree with that. There are distinct features that we have and I'm going to talk about the models now before, after I finish this. Now, what are the major drawbacks that we face. Why is productivity poor? There is no skilled labor, right? And today, five years ago, all the construction workers in my part of the country were from Bihar. Today, they are from Jharkhand. Extremely hardworking boys and girls. But once they are finished with this and they move on, all the skills that they have built over five projects goes with them elsewhere. And another industrialist pointed out, when my father started this factory, we were 15 kilometers from the town. Today we are with five kilometers within the town and all the labor there is no white collar, is no longer blue collar. These are realities. We do not get labor. We do not get labor period, forget skill labor. Inability to innovate is a serious problem for MSCs. I have already uh, described it. Too many rules and regulations, all of us are aware of it. Low value added. There's hardly any value added. A big company gives you a design, a drawing, a material, you produce it and you make an arbitrage of a few percent. That's all you do. What are the limitations? This is completely ignored. MSMEs and most Indian companies have an inability to develop markets. Our approach is and has been, I have a great product, come and buy. World's not like that. We'll have to understand market dynamics, and simply promoting and going around on a junket saying this is what we have and attending a few exhibitions is not what, is, what it is all about. It takes focused, concentrated work. And the best example that I have seen in my lifetime is the EDB and the uh, IE of Singapore, which has really helped the MSMEs come up to substantial sizes. Not only do they find markets, they find customers, they encourage the customers, they give you the money to meet the customer requirements and take you places. Price-based purchasing, that's very true. The standard rule in most companies is, if I can do it at 100 rupees, you should not be able to, you should be able to do it under 85 rupees. My question is, look, 60 rupees is your material cost. How is he going to do it at 85? Why should he do it at 85? After all, you may get four or 5% material cheaper, but for you, labor is more expensive. For him, the only component that he can save on is labor, but his material cost offsets that. And a significant element is that our banks don't understand the manufacturing model. They're using outdated metrics to evaluate uh, loans. And uh, Mukul and I have been working on a paper for some years now. Maybe it's time to pull it out and bring it out. Uh, SEBI has now started looking at the uh, metrics that a company has to report, public company has to report very differently. I think banking has to change. And as one young man put it, I can get a Honda at 7% loan, but if I want to buy a CNC machine, I have to pay 12%. The Honda can run away, but my CNC machine cannot. Right? It's grounded. That's the sort of conundrum that we need to address. But you'll also notice in the top five limitations, government policy is considered the least relevant. That is how irrelevant government policy making today is. That's what we need to look at and understand why. What do MSMEs require? help in product development, help in process efficiency, and capital for plant and machinery. 
this is the feedback that I have. This is with you, all of you. I've sent it to all of you. Working capital management, liquidity and cash. Yes, it is a serious issue. And all of this, a lot of work can be done using the net and the um, artificial intelligence around the, and IoT. Singapore has done something similar in this. We're making common accounting platforms for MSMEs and stuff. So we can think about a lot of things and there are solutions for many of these. It's not as though we are desperate and don't know what to do. So majority are tiny, undercapitalized, no ambition to scale, don't generate sufficient clash, cash, clueless about markets and customers, factor productivity we have discussed, factories, number of factories with 500 workers is discussed, GVA per worker in large factories is much higher. So there is a case for a size in MSMA manufacturing and as is the GVA, both the GVA per worker and GVA is much overall in the size of the factory is higher. Mukul mentioned this economy, efficiency and effectiveness. And this is the slide that we have used very often. If you want value for money, the resources are capital and cash, plant, machinery and knowledge, output, goods and services and outcomes. If you don't know the outcome, if you've not defined it, you cannot run an effective operation, whether it's manufacturing services, academics, or anything. You must know what you have to deliver to whom, by when, at what cost. Each industry vertical has to come up with that number and the government has to facilitate that. That is a key policy that has to be set out as a document. This is what we have to deliver. Who's the target audience? Who's the target market? At what cost? So we refer to it as the triple E, economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. Economy is not about cutting cost. Economy is about optimizing use of limited resources. Efficiency is about optimized use of plant and machinery. And effectiveness is the overall result that the business delivers in terms of value generation. I've defined this, so I won't stay with this. Now, what are the reference models? I personally prefer the Japanese construct. Mukul and I were having a discussion this morning. What's the German model? The German model is phenomenal. It goes back to the guilds from the Hanshia towns and goes back to more than a thousand years, where every trade has to be certified by the body that controls the trade, not by the government. And even a supervisor is not a person who becomes a senior operator who becomes a supervisor. A supervisor in a shipping company has to be trained as a supervisor in a shipping company. A supervisor in a textile factory has to be trained as a supervisor, not as an operator. So the German model has got a long cultural history. The Japanese less so. The Japanese go back only about 100 years and it's much easier to replicate because the German model is just taken for granted. So I'll dwell a little bit on the German model and then the Japanese model and then move to the German model. You can see their basic act, medium-sized enterprise basic act of 1963. Amended December 99, so they're fairly current. Basic measures, promotes promotion of business innovation. You can see the clause wise, what they've got, strengthening of business fundamentals, smoothing adaptation to changes, equity capital, administrative structure, small and medium enterprise policy making councils. This is the broad framework. I've given you the reference. You're welcome to take it. And we should be able to leverage on our goodwill with Japan and enable this. And the next slide will tell you why. You see the structure, prefectures, most of us are aware are like our states in Japan. You have METI, you have SMA, SME agency, nationwide SME functions, policymaker. And their complete architecture is open to us. Jetro is external trade. Finance corporation, there's, there's a banking operation. Credit guarantee, there's a separate, of course, they've used a Japanese spelling. Uh, so you'll have to forgive me for that. So what are the roles of chambers of commerce and industry? What is the commerce and industry association? And Anush made a point, which I wish to mention. Before the budget, every industry association only asks for the favors that it wants. Have you ever seen any industry association asking for what Indian manufacturing should, should, should look like in a, before any budget? CIA attempts it to an extent. But is it comprehensive? Let's decide that. And there are quite a few SMEs. So now they look at viability before providing funding. It's not that we say 20,000 crores is available. You can come and tap into it. We will waive interest for two years. That's to me was not a very great idea. And when I asked a lot of MSME people, the only question that they asked me is, 
yeah, I can take the loan, but I have to pay it back. No, I'm not sure how I'm going to pay it back. And this was the answer, which is why the take up on that was very limited. Startup can get the following support. Management consultation, providing startup advice. Right? Business incubation, expert advice and management. Now, we have all these building blocks lying around somewhere in our system. But I have interacted with some of these experts in management and experts in the business. These are people who have spent 40, 50 years in the business who have retired and are now taken over by the industry associations to help people in that vertical to grow. In other words, they are given help, assistance, and inputs to deliver the outcomes that the economy wants out of them. Funding investment in venture or support the company management is the last. It's not the first step. How are they developing it? They, Japan has to go international. They look at human resource cultivation, which we're going to talk about, environment and safety measures, support for manufacturing through comprehensive assistance in R&D. Innovation is not going to happen at the micro level. Support for regional, regional resource utilization, fostering cooperation, fund investment, and debt guarantee. You see, the finance always comes in the last. Whereas, any if you look at the balance sheet of the, I mean, the annual report of the Ministry of MSME, the finance is the first thing that we talk about. Right? That's the last thing we need to talk about. We must make it viable. Right? There's a mutual aid system, which is what the cluster concept is. Business safety, mutual relief system offers financial support to SMEs in an emergency situation like COVID, which we have done. Fund investment turnaround, if it's viable, and SME turnaround support fund. So this is the structure, and I've given you all the references here, and I'll be happy to share more of these references, because I think here is a solid model, a proven model, which we can work and adapt. What are the ways we have to adapt? too early to say, unless we know what the outcomes are and what our policy belief is, we can't adapt to this. So we need to keep this as a dynamic model and not a static model. The German, I'd rather talk about the ethos. Firstly, they price their employees. I was chatting with Srikant also. Um, okay, you get a guy very highly skilled and trained two years, you put him into the industry. Do you think that guy in Tirupur is going to pay that tailor any percentage more because he comes skilled? We don't, we don't pay for the services that we want because he doesn't get the end product. That is the pricing issue I spoke about in the feedback session. Most are family owned and managed over generations. I worked in a company in Germany, which was in the family for three generations. I'm still in touch with the fourth generation. When they come to Asia or I go to Europe, we always meet up and chat. That's the depth of relationship. We have no business dealings. The business dealings are with my family business, not with me. The cosmopolitan, yet very traditional employers, enticing career opportunities. I'm yet to see any turnover in a German SME, hardly. A guy becomes a designer, he becomes a chief designer 30 years later, he's able to innovate because he has been in that, steeped in that industry. They invest to create more jobs. Technology development is something that they are mad about. They do business for the long term. And they have a strong sense of social responsibility. You ask our guys to pay ESI and PF and you can see how much they crib about it. So this is the ethos from the German side. From the Japanese side, we have a practical down-to-earth approach about how to approach the setting up of successful MSMEs. If we can combine both, we can have our Indian model. Yes, it requires a huge cultural shift. How that's going to happen, when it can happen, will it happen? Those are moot points, but this is the ideal that we are looking at. This is very shocking. The skilled workforce in India, South Korea is 96%, Japan is 80%, in India it's 2%. So we have a very substantial job for training our people, very, very substantial. We have 5,000 public ITIs, and China has 500,000. And what I feel sad was the ITE model in Singapore was set up by our ITI bigwigs in the mid 60s. Today you go to an ITE, it is far more modern than most machine shops in India or most uh, training centers in India. The latest equipment, well-trained staff, extremely well adjusted with industry. Their complete training is based around industry demands. We taught them how to set it up. 
and yet we are laggards, right? So everywhere, the vocationally trained is 90% plus, and we know that the large industry accounts for less than 5% of India's employment. So we're not going to get away from this, and this is a transformation we need to look at. But there are puzzling numbers here, right, which I'll come to. Right. Now, lack of training facilities, I don't agree with it. There are lots of opportunities which we can talk about. New entrance into the workforce is only 4.75 million and not 12 million. So why are we looking at 150 million uh, vocational seats in the National Skill Development Fund? You need 4 million a year. 12 million a year, 15 million a year, assuming you want to retrain, assuming you want to get hold of the 8th standard, 10th standard, 12th standard dropouts who happened in the new education policy were given the option. So we have to size our problem. We are having numbers all over the place. Another document within uh, National Skill Development Funds talks about 406 million institutional seats for vocational training. That's one third of our population. Graduates' employability sadly has dropped from 56% to 37% in 2021. I've given you all the references. ITI, we talk about it, out of 750 odd thousand seats, only 75%, 76% is used. 24% is lying fallow. And the infrastructure is pathetic, I can tell you. So there's a huge opportunity there to revamp it and start using it. How do you transform? Form clusters. And this Next line I'm taking out of Srikant's uh, feedback to me, 10 corporates to nurture 100 mid-sized firms to nurture 10,000 MSME. Credit is to Srikant for that line. Focused industry relevant role specific skills, right? It's very sad. Every textile factory, garment factory I visit, one of the biggest shortages people who can iron. And ask yourself, without ironing, can you pack a shirt or a t-shirt? There are no ironers. And it's a job which nobody wants. So there's a huge lack of specific training skills. Tailoring, see a tailor can only make the needle go so fast. But if you want throughput out of an operation, you need to have skilled workforce at every level. Different levels of skills for sure, but you need it. Whether it's making, assembling cars or manufacturing metal parts or whether it is doing plastics, you need specific skill sets. And there are institutions in the South like the GD Training Institute which have identified and have been doing a phenomenal job for the last 40 years. So it's not unknown in India. Build a flexibility, because whatever we talk about today, within three to five years, the market dynamics is going to change. Mentor and coach the entrepreneur. CIA has a coaching program, but again, it has been reduced to a template. Coaching cannot be a template. It is very individual specific and business specific, which is what the Japanese have done if you go back and refer to what is there. India does not have a brand in manufacturing. China is known for its low, co low cost, high speed. Taiwan is known for its high quality, super quick turnaround. What is our brand? We don't have a brand. If you don't have a brand, you will not get a premium. Brand essentially requires, as it tells you, I will perform to what I promise and hence pay me more. Indian manufacturing does not have a brand as yet. We should build one. That's a transformation that we need to work on. Encourage and reward excellence. Loans can be cheaper, as I mentioned. Logistics, I think all of us know what a horrible situation we are in. And should GI, Government of India, be so prescriptive in training and manual, what CSR fund has to go where, who has to do what, I'll only do this, you'll have to go into tool room, you'll have to do this. You know, then it's the plethora of institutes that are involved in training is overwhelming. Frankly, I've read the, uh, on the net about eight, 10 times. I'm not able to get my mind around the number of people involved in scale, skilling and training, and yet we have only 2% of our workforce trained. Remember, the National Small Industries Corporation go back to the early 50s. I, my father was a beneficiary of that. And yet only 2% of our workforce is trained. Why? R&D is a wasteful process, and we need to encourage it. But let's be clear. It's not going to happen voluntarily. It's going to happen if there is a price arbitrage or a business benefit. MSME is going to struggle to do it. Current players are here. The emerging players are known. There's defense production, semiconductor, textile parks, pharma, all that Dr. Bharti defined fairly clearly, traditional Indian systems. But what I'm pointing out is electrical vehicles. Electric vehicles. They will obsolete substantial part of our current manufacturing infrastructure. Uh, 
electric vehicle has 20 major parts compared to about 16,000 in an IC engine, including nuts, fasteners, bolts, everything. All that is manufacturing jobs gone. It will require completely new technologies, materials, sensors, magnets, precision die casting, high strength plastics, integrated telematics. We are nowhere in all of this. Additive manufacturing. In construction, low-cost housing, IIT Madras has already done several pilot projects and you can build a full home in less than 22 days with additive manufacturing where you don't peel away material to make a shape. But you add material around the shape that you want. It has got immense potential in low volume manufacturing, low cost manufacturing, for example, limbs for doctors. And I was surprised, I was speaking to somebody at a dinner a few days ago. He exports more than 40 crores worth of bespoke garments manufactured in Gurgaon to America alone. A tailor there measures it and sends it. He, he produces it and ships it back. This is a manufacturing as a service. Mukul mentioned it. So there's potential and there's much more. I've just put in a few areas. MRO, maintenance and repair organization, additive manufacturing for spare parts. Of course, you need it licensed, you need it validated, you need it verified, all that is there. But that's a huge opportunity. People are getting into it, but struggling with it. Precision manufacturing. India does not make containers. Why? It is basically sheet metal, but it's precision sheet metal. It's not something that you can, you know, put it in good Lucknowi Hindi. It has to be manufactured high precision, right? A large container is a very high precision product. So are aero bridges. Oh, what's so great about aero bridges? Indonesia, which has no manufacturing infrastructure comparable with India, was making aero bridges in the mid 80s. And we are still importing it. And remember, 100 airports are coming up. Let us say each with five aero bridges, 500 aero bridges for India, replacements, exports, there's a market, but it's precision. Right? Uh, sheet metal. We do very crude sheet metal work. EV and other things will require high precision sheet metal and die castings. In fact, for Tesla, the entire base of the Tesla car is a die casting, it's a single piece. When that happens, your labor component will drop, but the precision requirement will go up. Electric motors, controls, Manufacturing is a service. I've already spoken about it, right? So what do the focus require? Skill set specific to the industry. Government as a facilitator and auditor. Map skill sets for current and emerging requirements at the highest level based on outcomes to be delivered by the sector. Here is where the strategy and outcome should come back. That should devolve into policy. Today, the data available is extremely confusing. Yes, training is a concurrent subject. Policy is from the center, the states are involved. But I was asking somebody, what is the policy that the center should enunciate? Nobody is able to mention it. And I think training is fine, but we need to pay. Anusha just sent me a note saying people prefer to work for 7,000 rupees as a salesperson in an insurance company rather than at 12,000 rupees in a manufacturing company. So when we're taking skill sets, how are we going to ensure that they are employed? Yes, the internship program that the government of India has started, I would leave to Shrikans to talk about it. It's a fantastic program. All the people who are using those interns are very happy with them. But will they stay in the industry after two years? Or all the training and they'll go off to some other industry for software coding? We don't know. All this and skill development ministry is a separate setup. So you have the Ministry of MSME, Ministry of Manpower, Ministry of Education, Ministry of uh, Skill Development, uh, National Skill Development Corporation. I think one of the things we need to do is integrate it into a single body and work with industry associations to take care of training. They know more about what they need. And that is where I go back to the outcome. What is to be delivered by whom to, at what cost? They will be able to manage it better. That is the secret of the guilds in all of Europe, just not Germany. It's there in Holland, it's there in Switzerland, it's there in France. We have vast resource base available. We have to channelize this. It can transform manufacturing and transform if only challenges are recognized and addressed. More of the same is not going to help us. Innovation, as in pharma, helps market development. Textiles. I was asking again, Anush sadly is not able to join us. Why is it that India imports uh, fabric, polyester fabric, synthetic fabric? His answer was 
India has the largest company in the world making the raw material for synthetic fabrics, makes it the cheapest, but it is still the costliest product in India. I don't want to name names, but the factory in the west coast of India is well known. We are still importing 30. Cotton is not imported, but very few people use cotton. Cotton availability is limited. The bulk of garments are made from synthetics, and we are still importing it from China. Right? And it has a huge consequence. I won't go into it. I have restructured the commenting company, so I know a little bit about it. The auto industry is in ferment. Right? IC engines have a life of 10, 15, 20 years, whichever way you look at it. Maybe the larger segments like shipping, ship and rail may have something for a little longer. But please bear in mind that in an IC engine, in a car, more than 50% of the car price is still imported. It contributes a significant amount of our current account deficit. Aluminium, rubber, chemicals, electronic components, carbon black for tires, all this is continues to be imported. So we need to look at base up on a number of factors. I've covered a broad swath. I've been extremely critical, but I think if you're going to have a policy shift, we need to have a critical analysis. It does not mean to say that we are critical of somebody or some institution, that's not the intent. But we need a critical evaluation of where we are. We need a clear understanding of where we want to be. And we need coherent approaches, policy, to take us there. I'd be happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I hand over the floor back to Professor Rusher to take it from here. Mukul? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank Professor Bharti. Yeah, for, for uh, uh, presenting a very uh, a uh, very intense uh, understanding about how India is going to transform in manufacturing with critical note, and uh, also comparing India with many smaller countries and also the big giants of the world. So uh, we will take up some of the questions, but before that, uh, uh, I would like to invite our discussant, uh, Mr. Srikant Rao for his, his remarks. Yeah. Mr. Rao? Yes, yeah. sir. Can you see me? Hear me? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, now this is a, a very difficult act to follow after Ram speaking with that sort of data and such a wide uh, perspective. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is just focus on one piece of what Ram talked about, and that is the skilling piece. And the rest of it, the policy, the macroeconomics, uh, you know, industry competitiveness, etc., is is beyond my pay grade. <laughs> but uh, skilling is an area which I is close to my heart, and I have spent a fair bit of time, both in my own business and uh, in my consulting to various organizations, plus in some social causes or social service that I've been doing on as an honorary task. So let me talk about. Uh, skilling. And uh, the paradox here is very interesting, sir. Right? I'm just going to put on my. Yeah. The paradox is uh, you have X percentage of India which is unemployed. That X percentage keeps varying, but it is pretty high. There's Y percentage which has got disguised unemployment. They've got some job, but, you know, really not the job that they were studied for or they want to do they just sort of floating around for years at a time doing something just to keep themselves occupied and uh, this percentage is growing right and on the other hand you have employers saying that for the love of money or god they can't hire people because whoever is educated whoever has got trained whether it's a ITI or a diploma holder or a graduate or a postgraduate or a PhD, uh, X percentage of them are un unemployable, right? Uh, so this is the paradox that uh, we are all fighting with and struggling with. And so this is an area which I have spent a little time on and so I'd like to speak about my experience in that and uh, some experiments that we've been doing, okay? Uh, uh, why is it that 
we have so much of education so much of training but less than 2% of them are employable or employed in the area that they are uh, be, they've been trained for okay uh, this is a fundamental question that uh, is very difficult to answer uh, my take on this is very simple uh, employers have started or have been encouraged to use an academic qualification as a filter to in in their whole recruitment process okay so the job that a person is going to do as ram said ironing of a clo of a, of a garment doesn't require a, a bcom or a ba or a bsc or a be all right uh, okay but people have used the fact that you need to be a graduate in order to do this type of a job now whether it's banking or insurance or manufacturing or any organization uh, the type of academic qualifications that are being asked for have no relevance to the job or the skills that they require okay? uh, in the so called software export industry as well we have people who are doing you know bca mca btech mtech etc and what are they doing uh, very simple coding 90 90% of them i'm not talking of everybody it's, that's a generalization but 90% of the coding work is very low end coding right and can be done by people without this type of qualification okay so case in point was we had uh, a software company where we do some report generation in a database pull out some data create some reports right not very rocket science we were able to train a girl who has just done 10th standard pass right 10th standard pass within 3 months she was generating reports uh, using sql server etc etc and generating uh, with a productivity which was fantastic right? far higher than our btech be ms mca companions right and the brilliant part of it was uh she was at the office 15 minutes before time and she was smiling throughout the day she had fire in her belly she wanted to grow all right and hats off to her we couldn't retain her she got a job with the multinational at three times the salary that i was able to pay but good for her right but that's a that's a point i'm trying to make that particular job did not require a graduate or a postgraduate degree it required someone to have been trained for 2 to 3 years to do just that job right and do it to the at to the quality level of uh, you know at a global scale and that's how a multinational which typically doesn't hire people without these type of qualifications picked up this girl who has not even done a pre university okay so in a way skilling was becoming very relevant problem we see in manufacturing is nobody wants to hire nobody wants to train and the mantra is de-skilling rather than skilling okay automation is the name of the game nobody wants to grow uh, ram you are talking of 500 people nobody wants to grow beyond 25 people right because i want to be in the msme card okay i don't even want to get into the uh, s or the medium scale all right because of labor and other issues okay so how do we get past these uh, issues okay uh the formula that you refer to ram that's 10 groups 1000 medium sized companies 10000 smes that's actually a mckinsey report or a strategy it's not my credit i was referring to mckinsey so due credit to them they actually presented that very well uh, yes there is a uh, light at the end of the tunnel all right i think what has been happening with the national skills development council is something that is very important we should be talking about that where uh, as ram said the job roles have been defined by the industry skills councils which are led by the industry associations all right and for each job role the curriculum and the skills requirement have been defined and so therefore training centers are being certified for those specific jobs right so 
For example, I work uh, as an honorary general secretary for the National Association for the Blind, and we used to have an ITI which was conducting the fitter course, the standard fitter course for visually impaired people, right? And we were trying to force fit them into industry. Okay, it doesn't make sense. So we stopped that, and now we're starting to work with the NSDC. Identified specific jobs for specific industries. Let's say for assembly and packing, for example, in garment, or in light engineering, or plastics, or food processing, and we are starting to conduct courses, three-month course, two-month course, specifically for those industries, and then getting them placed as interns or apprentices in their industry. Okay, so this is the direction I think we should be heading. Uh, my time is almost up. But I think I'd like to conclude by one simple model, which I think has also been successful, is if you go to Manipal, in addition to the MBBS course, there is a complete suite of products being generated called SOHAS, Applied Health Sciences, and some 28 different jobs have been defined and courses are being conducted for each one of them. And that's what is going to address the skills requirement in the medical industry. I think something like this is something we need to look at more later. Thank you. May I just come in to support what Srikant said? Uh, Mukul, Professor Bharti. Please, please, please. Let's see, if you look at our ITIs, look at our engineering colleges, medical colleges, or science colleges, 70 to 80 percent of the time the labs remain unused. Okay. The machine shops remain unused. Right? Can we train the trainers and use that time. Today, you have work from home, which can be done for all the theory courses. These cheap people can go over the weekend or in the afternoons or evenings when the labs are not occupied. They can be trained. And in this way, from to take off from Srikant, yes, the directions are right. But we need millions upon millions of these people available because the solution to the problem of, is to have a solution of a problem of plenty. If you have a lot of surplus labor, skilled labor, this labor migration, people switching jobs, changing jobs, that will drop automatically. Till then, it's going to be a constant phenomenon. Can we not use the available or reshape the available infrastructure? As Peter Drucker put it 50 years ago in his own way, he says, the biggest lack of productivity is the classroom because it's used for two hours and three hours in a day. <laughs> Prof, no insult meant. <laughs> That's all we're using it for. Same thing with our labs. We can take these ITIs. We can run it on a three-shift basis. We can tell people what, it, what is happening. And we can use these resources. Every engineering college has a set of labs that are underutilized. Every medical college has labs underutilized. Every science college has labs underutilized. So to take on from where Srikant said, can we plan on training millions of things with available infrastructure and upgrading it? Yes, it requires a massive upgrade, no doubt about it, because other than the four walls, much of it is already 50 years old. As he said, training a guy, a blind guy to do some fitting and filing work is not the be all and end all of it, because fitting and filing once electronics takes hold of our life is going to drop by about 60%. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Rao, and then uh, uh, the, the post uh, discussion, we, we want some questions from the audience or, or uh, anyone from, the, uh, from, from our own panel, if, if there is any question to anyone. So we can take up some of the questions. Professor Bharti, may I make yes. a comment? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, there is some discussion going on that one way to expand employment opportunities is that we have not given sufficient attention to India's multi, multiple languages. You know, we've got large numbers speaking Bengali, Gujarati, Tamil, in, uh, Hindi is there, but others. So I just read that the Madhya Pradesh is going to start MBBS and other medical programs in Hindi. 
Now that means, you know, there are a lot of people with good mind and talent, but English, overemphasis on English has been uh, one of the reasons why some of the opportunities get constrained. So if we can use our languages more innovatively, more extensively in different regions of India, then there might be possibility of some employment opportunities opening up and some innovative local thinking would also Yes, uh, uh, Professor Asar, I had a uh, I had a short uh, discussion in Jetro uh, in Tokyo uh, about uh, uh, about uh, why Japanese investment is more in China and less in India. So I wanted to know what are the main region. So uh, as a part of that discussion, I got uh, uh, four points which basically restrict Japanese investment in India and four major cause behind not getting more investment in manufacturing sector is, the first thing is uh, uh, Indians are talkative. The second point is uh, the food is uh, having lots of gravy and from morning to evening, uh, all most of the food items are, uh, are, are, are gravy. And the third point is the climate, uh, humid, hot, uh, many, many months are humid and hot. And uh, uh, that was the third point. And the fourth point is many language. So this uh, language, which is, uh, which is also the part of our culture that restrict the investment uh, from, from the Japanese side, that is, that is basically you know, these, these points are raised by uh, the person who are really the in charge of uh, Japanese investment in India. So I took it very, uh, very seriously that uh, whether these social or cultural points can also be uh, a point for the investors uh, looking India as an investment destination, uh, comparing when, when China has a uh, different type of climate and uh, uh, very, very uh, closely food culture and uh, and also the single language. So, uh, uh, but sometimes when we are we are uh, running for uh, making manufacturing uh, into a big jump, we have to also think for how can we nurture our people. So the the outcome of the discussion is uh, is moving towards skilling skilling up the people, and that is the need of our because uh, most of our speakers and discussions are, discuss, discussions are uh, uh, constantly arguing for how to how to uh, skill up our uh, our uh, capability because investment will come but what about uh, the complementary factors which can also uh, which can also uh, motivate them to further investment so uh, if if uh, uh, i can have a question from anyone uh, one of the question uh, Dhananjay is asking about, let me just read out the chat. One of the students from IIT Patna is asking a question that, uh, what would be the best possible strategy to raise economy in agri sector, in tribal areas in India, in terms of employment opportunity? So uh, may I request uh, uh, Professor Asar to answer or or, or. Ram, Ram can answer first, Ram can, Ram can and I will, I yeah, will right. make my contribution later. Okay. okay. See, I live in an area uh, where there are about 300 tribal villages in the Nilgiris. I understand the situation reasonably well, though I can't say it's hands-on or it is not tactile. In the agri sector, in the tribal sectors, in the tribal areas, every resource is missing. 
and the level of ill health in these sectors is extraordinary. I'm, I was part of an NGO where we tried to help promote organic farming because they have cows, they have all the access to generating the organic farming products. I myself am an organic farmer, so I understand it reasonably well. The question is, the level of health and education is so backward. The women are very hardworking. They took up organic farming of herbs. We bought the herbs from them, gave them a clear 24, 25% margin. We retained 8% for our management cost and supplying some of the inputs. But these poor ladies are extremely anemic. They're very sick. And much of the money that they earn gets taken away by the men. So we should not look at it as a tribal area problem. I think we should look at it as a human developmental problem. Education is the key. The district collector here wanted through COVID to establish online uh, classes. But some of the tribal areas were so deep in the forest, there was no broadband. Right? We, we just concluded an eye camp uh, two weeks ago for the tribal children. And we literally had to send our auto rickshaw garbage bin collectors with a loudspeaker, asking them to come for the tribal thing because everything was free. It was done by a leading institution called Arvindai Hospital, free of cost. The children were examined. We focused on the children because the children's eyes are bad. Their education suffers. They gave them free lenses, free spectacles. The children were taken to Coimbatore for major surgery in case they required it. But the moment you see it, you realize that the human development index is so poor, we need to focus on that primarily, give them good nutrition, give them good food. How is the question? Because through COVID, what has happened is, everybody has gotten used to eating tons of rice and uh, dal, nothing else. Diabetes is high, anemia is high. So if I start trying to improve this as a superstructure without reaching the basic needs, we will be missing the bus. We have to have a lot of humility to accept that we have not done a great job of it. And these village hamlets are small, 20 families, 10 families. They are 10, 15 kilometers away from the major routes. Very often you can't go and you need a four-wheel drive to get there. So we have to look at this as a basic problem. I don't have a ready-made solution. If I had, I would have spoken about it. Simply taking them, bringing them to the urban area, giving them a degree and giving them a job is not going to work because you're not lifting up the basic uh, health and nutrition of these people. Uh, right. If I and may, let's let's say be also something. very uh, let's be sorry. very very clear. People who have access to job jobs are in the urban and rural areas, right? So they are going to fight for the last bit of scrap that is necessary. And on this point, I will touch on what Mukul said. Ninety-five percent of the youth in the area that I live in cannot speak a word of English or Hindi. They cannot get a job outside of Tamil Nadu. So I don't know if language, regional language focus is going to help. And in the context of the tribals, many of them have their own uh, sub-languages, sub which makes it very difficult to communicate as well. Yes. Mukul, you were saying something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll just compliment. I, I, uh, I'm broadly in agreement that human development needs to take place. But I would like to suggest that we don't think of the tribal problem because it is very context specific. Different tribal areas, different parts of India have got very context specific things that are different and what they, uh, will be uh, benef benefit what they, would, what they would benefit from, those measures are different. I'll give one example where I was involved as an advisor in Chota Udaipur, which is in state of Gujarat. And the, I, I went to Chota Udaipur, the tribal area, uh, with the NGO and said, okay, what can be done? The, you are right, improving nutrition, uh, more balanced diet, others, these are necessary. 
But one of the things that we found in that tribal region is that if we can do some tech dams, improve the uh, fertility of the soil and so on, if they can go from one to two crops per year, they can improve their incomes and their livelihoods. The other thing we did was to say that, why not an NGO uh, 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 that I was working with, why can't NGO give its name so that when tribals grow jira or any other thing, instead of selling jira, they brand it. So there is a packaging skill. If there is paddy, some simple rice mill, which women can run, can be taught, some accounting can be taught. And so we found that for them, that kind of uh, a course of action improved their livelihoods. For some other tribals, it may be different. Um, so, so I don't think we should overgeneralize. Yeah, thank you, Professor Asar. We have one more question about India has signed trade agreements with uh, advanced countries like Japan and Korea. The trade deficit is increasing in manufacturing sector over years. What do you suggest for such trade agreements? Ram, shall I take it? Take it. I'll follow up with what you have to say. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, earlier we were in a bit of a rush to conclude the trade agreements. And we did not pay enough attention to balance between goods and services, where services is where we have a little bit better advantage. And we did not pay attention to implementation integrity. In other words, is the trade agreement going to be implemented by the other party in the spirit in which it was signed. So what we have now is that we have just started a new series, which are more balanced. They look at India's self-interest much better, and they are looking at whether the implementation will be done in a reasonably fair way. So there is more hope that the trade agreements will result in better benefits to us uh, when we do it with UAE, for example. Uh, with UK, we are uh, at the advanced stage. With Australia, we are at even more advanced stage. So we are going to do with some of these uh, these countries and even with Canada, we are negotiating, we have started negotiations. So earlier we focused only on Asia and East Asia. Now we have broader uh, canvas and more focused uh, attention on India's interest. Having said that, trade agreements are not the only thing uh, or not even the major thing that affect trade deficit. Trade deficit is affected by our competitiveness, what Ram has presented in great detail. And it's only recently with Atmanirbhar globalization, with Be Vocal for Local, all the other things Professor Bharti talked about, we are paying attention about how to be globally competitive, produce for global markets as compared to before. So let's just wait for a while to see what 
outcomes we obtain. As I mentioned, 21, 22 uh, export outcomes are fairly encouraging and we are setting very ambitious targets uh, till 2030. See, to come in, uh, let us understand what trade agreements are about. Trade agreements are not about benefiting India as a country. It is essentially a route to find A, how they can deliver their products and services into India, or B, get a ring fence around resources from India that their industry and society can use. I have been involved with AFTA, the Asian Free Trade Agreement, which was a successor or which was copied from NAFTA in the mid 90s. And every country came up with the idea, oh, wonderful idea AFTA, but all of us have to be dollar neutral in our transactions. Now, how is that possible? If you're not making cars and you're importing cars and the other guy is buying rice from you, you're never going to be dollar neutral. So these trade agreements are barriers and particularly in the East Asian countries, there is an insidious barrier of language which is used. I have done more than eight joint ventures in Japan. And I can tell you their faces will go blank and they'll start speaking Japanese when something inconvenient comes up. I have sat down with a Japanese gentleman who's a great lover of India. He sits in Delhi. I have about 25 PowerPoints where he has explained how the Japanese do not are not serious about uh, certain barriers. We need to accept that. The question is, as Mukul pointed out, if India is economically sound, socially it is integrated, and politically it is confident, we will get better terms for our free trade. For example, with oil now we are currently going through, that we are getting oil at a preferential price because India is now a desired destination. Why? Economically, India is getting onto a sounder footing. And let us face it, that is what people respect. Socially, India is still in a bit of a tension, but it is on a road towards integration. How it will happen, when it will happen, whether we're going to be secular, not secular, I don't know. I'm not lying to look at the, uh, through a telescope to find out what it is. And politically, we are savvy. We know what we want. We know what outcomes we want. Therefore, we are able to frame the agreements. And simple example is what's happening in the Galwan border. We have refused to yield because we know what we want. I wonder how many of you picked up what our national NSA told his Chinese foreign minister. Of course, I'll come to China, but first sort this problem out. That confidence is essential. And I think going forward, the free trade agreement, we have done so many, but if you really look at it, why did we walk out of that uh, BRICS and East Asia zone? Because it is not beneficial to India. We said, okay, fine, you guys go ahead. We don't need it. You need Indian market access. You're not willing to give me the same access. Now, whether you're competitive or not competitive, that's a second issue. Of course, we have to be competitive. Are we competitive? In certain segments, yes, like pharma, software, services, we are good. In certain areas, we are not. Defense, we're increasingly become extremely competitive. So FTAs will only work if there's a mutual need and one side is able to fulfill the needs of the other in specific terms. This is my take on FTAs and joint ventures. Essentially, an FTA comes from a position of weakness, not from a position of strength. You have what I don't have. I have what you don't have. Therefore, let's get together. I see, I see Professor Bharti smiling. Yeah. So, thank you very much uh, for answering these questions. Now, uh, uh, I will ask, uh, I will request uh, all the speakers for uh, uh, way forward, one or two minutes way forward on uh, by by each of the speaker so uh, starting from uh, uh, from uh, mr ramkrishnan then uh, mr srikant rao and then uh, i will include uh, professor ashar's way forward and the chair's remarks together uh, in the last so we'll start with uh, 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 mr ramkrishnan sir and then uh, mr srikant rao sir or way forward in one or two minutes. I think the first step should be to identify sectors which will satisfy the basic needs of the people. This could be five or 10 sectors which are essentially about well-paid jobs, 
for which we need skilling. We need aspirational sectors, which will help India sustain as it moves forward. We can't have 45 sectors to develop. We need to have sequential development because if I develop textiles and garments today, I can't be developing it again 20 years from now. It has to go on a self-sustaining mode. We should bring it up to speed and let it go. The government of India should be a facilitator and a promoter, not a micromanager. We need extremely thoughtful processes to skill our businessmen. Our managers today are very inept. They are not capable of managing a highly competitive business. They don't think that way. So we need to put a lot of time into upgrading those skills. And we need help for these businesses to actually find customers and ensure the quality and the competitiveness is maintained. There are methods of doing it. I can't, I can't get into it. It's not going to be easy. It has not been attempted in too many places, but it is not as though it is an impossible feat to task because there's a requirement somewhere. There's a potential to produce it somewhere and we need to identify what needs to be made to happen. Right? That's my way forward for this whole discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, I will request uh, Srikant Rao, sir, for, for his way forward. Yeah. Um, in addition to all the mechanics of creating uh, you know, trainers, training institutes, skilling, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a social element which needs to be addressed, which is, uh, you know, the respect or dignity of labor. Mm -hmm. right? uh, we need a huge mission uh, to, to sort of extol and change the mindset of parents, change the mindset of students, change the mindset of youngsters, mm -hmm. saying that, you know, labor is not labor in the sense manual labor is not something that you should look down upon and you shouldn't only aspire to be a white collar worker in a bank or a software company right uh, a, a job in a manufacturing unit a job as a plumber a job as a garbage cleaner all right is a job which pays you well which gives you a career and which can take care of your children and your family that is something that has to be propagated right and i know if we can ensure that polio is eradicated i'm sure we should be able to do that but that's the type of campaign that is required sir. thank you very much and now i will uh, request professor Rasar for his way forward and also for uh, his uh, remark as a chair last remark as a chair hey, thank you uh, professor Bar uh, Mr. Ramkrishnan's presentation was very comprehensive with a lot of insights and a lot of things to think about. This transformation is not all very easily done. Neither it is quickly done. So how do we get longer term focus on increasing India's relevance to the world. I would say that people should feel that India brings something to the global table, whether it is in trade, economics, investments, technology, culture, civilization, security and so on. And how do we communicate that is, uh, uh, should be in my view, the focus for the coming, for the coming years. Uh, because that the, sometimes the unfortunate, unexpected events like the NATO, Ukraine, uh, Russia war has suddenly made Indian wheat much more alluring and a lot of countries are coming to India to buy Indian wheat. But that is a passing phenomenon. How, if we want to be relevant in wheat, we have to see how we do what uh, Mr. Ramkrishnan has suggested improve productivity, focus, scaling, and all the others. 
the other area that I'm somewhat more hopeful about, but um, Mr. Ramkrishnan didn't quite touch on, is that India is beginning to develop a good startup system and good technology startups and entrepreneurship. We also have space starts up now, agricultural technology startups uh, and so on. Is there a potential as we, have, we now have close to 90, I think, unicorns uh, and large number of startup? Is there something that is dynamically changing which can also help the MSME sector become more dynamic and grow. So I think I would uh, explore that particular uh, avenue as well uh, as a way of transformation, uh, including in our thinking. So the drone technology is now being used to spray pesticides. This is going to mean some agricultural traditional jobs will be lost, but it will also mean that new skills will come up and it doesn't require much education to be a drone flyer. And it will change the mindset of the agriculture uh, community. And I think that that mindset change that yes, we can do it. We don't have to call ourselves third world and so on. We want to be up there. We want to be a major player at the global table. And we are going to have our uh, all our diplomatic other efforts to try to get there if that focus is sustained, then I think we can be a lot, lot more hopeful about the future. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, uh, Professor, Mr. Srikant Rao, for your comments on the skills. I was involved with Haryana when they started the skills, I think one of the first skills university uh, in there. But again, you know, the initiative was so good. Our discussions were very intense when their vice chancellor had talked to me uh, in Delhi. Uh, but I think the uh, it has become a bit more bureaucratized than I would like. And we need to give credentials for the bricklayers, the others, welders, and so on, which are recognized. Once those are credentialed, then in this credential world, they will be able to get a premium uh, on, on their work. So the idea is just like from piece of land, uh, more crop per drop and more crop per piece of land, we need to have more value per, per a skill set and how you do that, that will be another possibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So let me just uh, uh, conclude and sum up the entire discussion. So as uh, uh, Ram Krishnan uh, uh, has argued that uh, uh, India uh, need a transformation, not a change. And uh, for that transformation, uh, the clarity in our policy and as well as uh, the political will must be strong enough. And he further argued that this entire make in India uh, should not be uh, for India. The program should not be for India, but for the world. So uh, that, that basically supplement, that basically complement uh, the the 
the discourse of export promotion because as long as we are not reaching to the global market, uh, whatever we are doing at the domestic level uh, for the local consumption, that is not going to generate uh, future employment and also the earnings. So uh, that is the point which I have noted down from his lecture. And then, uh, uh, then uh, Srikant Rao has also pointed out that there are two challenges which uh, Indian manufacturing sector is facing right now, uh, especially in terms of the scaling up. So one, uh, the first one is how to scale up. And then the second one is how to retain the skilled in the same form and the sectors. Because training, retraining, and uh, uh, keep on training the people and then they are not continuing in the job, that is the biggest challenge which many industries are facing in India, including many software industry also. So, and uh, uh, Professor Rasher's remark and uh, his argument that how uh, the last, uh, 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 last financial year is showing India's uh, new items added uh, uh, to the exports, such as the defense export, which has been raised, which, which is almost uh, uh, $135 billion export of the defense item. So these items were not the items in India's export list. Now India is uh, adding in new items and also the engineering exports, uh, engineering products exports. And Professor Asar has also pointed out, I was just calculating that 20% Gujarat and 20% Maharashtra each and 9%, uh, uh, I think, Karnataka, uh, the 9% uh, of export. Uh, UP. 9% was UP. UP. Yeah. Uh, and, so the, and, uh, and Andhra each. 9% Andhra and UP. Hmm. So if I will only include Gujarat, Maharashtra, and UP, that contributes around 50% of India's export. So few states are, uh, are uh, exporting states, and few states are. Uh, uh, Poorly exporting is, uh, states and few states are not exporting states like Bihar. So uh, this, these are the points which makes uh, uh, makes us very aware in a situation when uh, when we are talking about India, are we are we also talking about inclusive India or inclusive is export? Uh, exporting by different states, ex uh, those potentials which are which were not tapped till now, that has to be tapped more quickly because today's loss is the loss for the future. So the state-wide uh, uh, comparison and also the contribution of uh, some of the countries in terms of export uh, in Professor Asar's presentation uh, were not that we are really uh, growing fast uh, due, to, due to the contribution of some states, but not by each state and every state. So in, in, in one of the talk, when Professor Asar has pointed out that e each district uh, must identify uh, one product, which they can target uh, for manufacturing and export. So that is strategy and, uh, and, the, and the comment uh, from uh, uh, from Ramakrishna sir and Srikant Rao sir, that uh, the political will and the clarity in the policy and uh, not looking only for the small change. We have to basically, uh, basically shift the curve. We have to shift the production possibility curve. We do not have to move on the production possibility curve. So I think uh, with, with these points, uh, I would like to again thank all the discussant, our chair, Professor Asar, uh, our speaker, uh, Mr. Ram Krishnan, sir, for, for sharing uh, some of the thoughts on this occasion. And thank you, IMPRI, for organizing such events uh, when India is really looking for the new dimensions and directions. Thank you very much. Now I am handing over uh, this floor to IMPRI people. Ernika? As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Karnika, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, 
would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Study of Econo Finance and Economics. We are grateful to Professor Mukul Asher for chairing the session, to V. Ramakrishnan for taking out the time for being with us and sharing such th thought provoking talk on strategic framework for outcome driven policy to transform manufacturing in India. We thank our discussants, Shrikant Rao, Anush Ramasamy, and series moderator, Professor Nitin Bharti. Thank you for adding your diverse perspectives and valuable insights into the deliberation. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on podcast. I hope that you continue to tune into future into our IMPRI hashtag web policy talks. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Good evening.